Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm William Morgan. I have an official title these days. I used to be the person who speaks a lot about Linkerd. Now I have an official role in the project, which is called director. Uh, so I'm in a, officially in a markdown file in a GitHub repo with that. Um, so thank you all for coming. Today, this is our KubeCon uh, EU project update talk. I'm going to try and keep this you know, pretty uh, high level and pretty informal. So, um, you know, and probably there'll be lots of space for questions at the end, so feel free to come up afterwards. Um, and if I don't get a chance to answer your questions, myself and then a bunch of the Linkerd maintainers are hanging out at the project pavilion, the CNCF project pavilion, there's a Linkerd booth there. So please come say hi to us. We'd love to talk to you. Um, all right, so I've, you know, I've, I've titled this talk, and I think the title has changed a little bit um, since what's officially on the schedule. Uh, I'm going to talk about VM support, I'm going to talk about egress, I'm going to talk about Spiffy, and then I'm going to talk about more. So uh, hopefully this is what you were expecting. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I've got, I'm going to warn you, I've got two or three slides in here that we've been using for probably eight years. So. And one day we're going to, you know, sometimes we'll update the numbers and stuff. One day we'll, we'll give these another bit of polish. But, you know, just imagine a bunch of uh, beleaguered open source nerds, you know, frantically trying to put slides together at the very last minute. Definitely not what happened in this talk, but you can imagine that, you know, is happening maybe for some of these other talks. Uh, so what is Linkerd? It's a service mesh. Uh, I do have one slide about what a service mesh is, so don't worry if, if you've never heard that term before. Get ready for, you know, a, a thrilling journey. Uh, created originally by a company called Buoyant, eight plus years in production, you know, almost 10,000 Slack channel members. So if you have a, a moment to go to slack.linkerd.io and you don't have to say anything, just log in. That'd be great because I'd love to get that finally to, to 10,000 people in that, in that Slack. Um, lots of GitHub stars and contributors and, and, and things like that. And we've been a, a CNCF project since almost the beginning of the CNCF. I think we, we joined in 2016 as the fifth project, uh, and we joined as a, uh, they didn't have incubation back then, they called it inception. So we joined as an inception level project. All right, but ultimately, I like to think about this as like a job. What job does Linkerd have? So Linkerd's job is to give every platform engineer in the world the tools they need to create a secure, reliable, and observable cloud native platform. Now, Linkerd is pretty Kubernetes specific, so if you're not using Kubernetes, this is, it can't really do its job. But if you are, then this is how I think of, you know, kind of what we're trying to, to, to provide to you. We want to give you the ability to build a platform and, you know, to build it on top of Kubernetes that has those three properties, right? Secure, reliable, observable. Linkerd is not a complete solution. We can't fix every security aspect, you know. Of, of running a, a modern cloud native application, but we can do a chunk of it. And same thing for, uh, for re reliability and observability. So that's our job. All right, as promised, what is a service mesh? Um, it's an infrastructure layer that provides those, you know, those, those three kind of properties at the platform level. And I'll talk about some of the features that, that we do that fall into each of those buckets. You can think of it as like a, an L7 capable network you know, that's debatable from the network engineering point of view, but it's a nice model. Um, it is uniform across your entire application, so we don't require you to make application changes. And the way that Linkerd works specifically, because there's different implementations, um, is that we have these things called, pro well, they're proxies. We call them micro proxies because they're really small and they're really specific to Linkerd's use case. And we stick them right inside the pods. It's called the sidecar model. Um, and then they handle all the traffic to and from those pods. And then you, we've got a set of other processes that live in a namespace somewhere that is called the control plane. So those, those, those proxies are called the data plane, and then we've got these other processes called the control plane that give you the ability to um, manipulate those proxies as a whole. So in the olden days, the thought of deploying 10,000 proxies was like horrifying. The magic of Kubernetes is that we can do that and we can, you know, and, and we can make it kind of usable for you. All right, is this making sense so far to everyone? I see nodding heads. All right, good. Okay, one talk uh, uh, happening at this conference that I want to call out right off the bat is, um, you know, I talked about, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Rust in the, in the proxy, and that's kind of, you know, what the, the interesting uh, kind of story has been for Linkerd so far. We actually have started to introduce Rust in the control plane as well. And that is a little more interesting in, in the sense that 
that is a part of um, Linkerd that has to interact with the Kubernetes API. So the proxies themselves are actually totally independent of Kubernetes. They don't know anything. They're, they're specific to Linkerd, so the proxies themselves only talk to the Linkerd API. They're not general purpose proxies. They're not like Envoy. They're not like Nginx. Um, but the proxies don't know anything about Kubernetes. In the control plane, of course, your whole job is to interface with Kubernetes. So we started to do that in Rust. It has been um, complicated, let's say. Uh, it's been fast, safe, and sane, apparently. So please, uh, if you have time tomorrow to catch this talk, uh, Matei, one of our Linkerd maintainers, will be talking about uh, some of the work we've been doing there. All right. So, you know, if I were to describe kind of the design philosophy of Linkerd, you know, we want to do... We want to do less. We want to make it simple. We want to make it especially simple to operate, right? So our goal is if you are the, the, the poor beleaguered SRE or platform owner or, or wh whatever it is who's tasked with building a platform on top of Kubernetes, we want to give you something that should basically just work out of the box, right? And shouldn't cause uh, a crazy amount of resource consumption, shouldn't require you to have to wake up at three in the morning you know, and, and you should be able to build kind of like a mental model of how Linkerd works, and you should be able to, you know, when, when Linkerd is doing something that's unexpected, you should be able to then understand, you know, okay, why is this happening? Now, you know, that's the goal. We're, we're never perfect, but uh, that's, that's kind of our design philosophy, and that's informed a lot of the, the way that we've developed features and the architecture and even the choice to, um, to, to use sidecars, which is a little, maybe a little, I wouldn't say controversial, but... Uh, you know, is not the only option in the modern in the modern uh, service mesh ecosystem. All right. Uh, so, what makes Linkerd unique? You know, many things, but one big one, kind of from the architectural component, is you know we we build these uh, we we build it on top of these Rust proxies, and these micro proxies are custom built for Linkerd. It's a part of the stack that we own, we control, uh, and Rust gives us a whole bunch of cool properties. So, if you're a languages nerd. Rust has, you know, a very powerful and sophisticated type system, okay? It probably doesn't impact, you know, you in a direct way if you're a consumer of Linkerd, but if you're a programmer, it's cool. Um, more importantly, Rust compiles the native code so we can make these proxies as fast as possible, right? As fast as C or C++. That's really important for a proxy. Go is great, and there's lots of components of Linkerd on the control plane side that we do in Go. On the proxy side, we really need something like Rust so we can be as fast as humanly as com computationally possible. Um, and then uh, it also gives us these really nice security guarantees. So the whole point of Rust, the reason that language was invented more or less was so you can have a language that's as fast as C and C++, but that circumvents an entire set of memory safety vulnerabilities, buffer overflow exploits, the whole set of memory management stuff that Rust can enforce for you. And so if you're building a security-focused product, that's a really, really powerful property because it means you get a whole bunch of, you get to avoid a whole bunch of like the classic issues that you see um, with, with languages like C and C++. Uh, the other thing that I think is kind of cool is the state of the art in, uh, in, in, in user space networking is all happening in Rust. Like these libraries are where all of the, the brightest minds of you know, asynchronous networking in user space uh, go to, to spend their time. So we get to take advantage of really, really, really cool stuff that's happening under the hood there. Ultimately, though, from the operator spec perspective, right? so that's kind of like the design perspective. From the operator perspective, the, we really want this proxy to be an implementation detail. So we don't want you to have to think about the proxy as like a new operational component that you have to care for and feed and maintain, right? And if you're familiar with, you know, the, the, uh, the good old days where we had our Nginx in the front and then our Rails app and our database, like each of those components required, you know, a lot of uh, care and feeding. Uh, we'd like, and, and we, we get 99% of the way there, we'd like the proxies in Linkerd to, to not have that property. So they should be as much as possible in implementation detail. All right, how's everyone doing out there? A lot of thrilled faces. Okay, excellent. All right, so I, I mentioned this word very briefly. I'm not going to talk too much about um, sidecars versus eBPF versus ambient versus whatever. Um, I have, 
I've included that in, the, in this version of the talk in, in earlier conferences, and I've got a blog post and stuff about that, you know, with, uh, with our uh, kind of the results of our analysis. But there is a talk that um, Matei, who's a Linkerd maintainer, Mike Beaumont, who's a, I think, a, a Kuma maintainer, um, are doing about sidecar containers in Kubernetes. That's happening on Friday. I'd encourage you to go visit that talk. Um, there's a little bit of service mesh content in there because, you know, obviously these are two service mesh projects. But uh, what I think is more exciting is sidecars actually are like a new uh, comp official component to the Kubernetes API as of only last year. So we've been talking about sidecars since like 2015. As it's always been just a model for how we deploy stuff. It's been a model that says, okay, you stick a container next to another container, right? But now for the first time, we actually have a, 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 an official sidecar container like mode in Kubernetes and that fixes a bunch of the warts um, involved with uh, uh, kind of the just uh, uh, sidecars, especially around things like uh, jobs and, you know, uh, containers that are expected to terminate. So cool stuff in this talk. Please go check it out. Okay, so I don't think this talk is going to be super long, but we'll do, we'll do our best. All right, uh, Linkerd year in review. So if you imagine the year starts with KubeCon EU23 and ends with KubeCon uh, EU24. So I'll talk about, we, I think we had two, ma uh, three major releases in that time frame. The first was Linkerd 2.13. So uh, in this one, we added this, uh, in this release, we added the idea of dynamic, what we call dynamic request routing. This is basically routing of traffic based on the specifics of HTTP and gRPC requests. So you can route individual requests now based on headers, based on verbs, not based on the body. So we don't uh, uh, dig into that. And this was kind of the second release where we started uh, relying very heavily on the gateway API. So there's probably 17 other talks at this conference about the gateway API. I'm not gonna repeat too much about what it is, but it's a cool set of CRDs and an API that's built into your Kubernetes cluster today that gives you fine grained control over traffic matching and traffic routing and things like that. So the vision for Linkerd is, you know, gateway API is still kind of evolving, especially in the service mesh space, but we're tracking that evolution. And I think the, the vision for us will be um, uh, at the end of the day, you're basically configuring Linkerd almost entirely through gateway API primitives. And then you have some really nice advantages. A, they're on your cluster already, which is nice, right? We don't have to install a whole bunch of new CRDs. Um, and B, it's the same configuration that you potentially could be using for your ingress and maybe for egress control as well. So there's this glorious future that you can all, a glorious YAML based future that you can all envision where you're using gateway API types to control kind of every aspect of L7 traffic routing in your cluster. We're not quite there, but we're taking steps uh, in that direction. So yeah, Linkerd 2.12, we introduced that for some of the um, authorization policy stuff. 2.13, we started using those same gateway API types for this uh, request routing. And there's some cool examples of things you can do with this. Um, usually you have to do a little work to actually, you know, get to the point where you're doing things like sharding per region because the, um, uh, of the nature of how the, H, uh, the gateway API types work. But it's now possible in a way that was not possible prior to 2.13. Okay, the other thing we added in this release was circuit breaking. So this is the ability to know when an endpoint is failing and to stop delivering traffic to it. And again, Linkerd, you remember we're operating in L7 world. So by failure, we don't mean it's refusing connections, I mean, although that is a class of failure that we can detect, but we mean, oh, it's returning 500s. So if you're talking to an endpoint that's overloaded and it starts returning 500s, rather than adding more load and making things worse, you know, by retrying or whatever, we can short circuit that and we can say, let's, back off, let's not send any traffic there, and let's let it recover, and then every once in a while we'll try, and we'll say, oh, it's ready. It's, it's uh, um, you know, it's healthy now, and we'll, we'll kind of gently ease traffic back onto it. All right, so that was 2.13. So remember, there's three releases we did in the, in the past KubeCon EU-centric year. Um, so 2.14, we introduced uh, what we're calling flat network multi-cluster. So, Linkerd has had multi-cluster for, you know, ever since 2.9 or something in the, in the olden days. And the way that has worked is we've had a gateway component that sits on the destination cluster, right? And by multi-cluster, you know, of course, you can always run multiple Kubernetes clusters. What we really mean here is communication between Kubernetes clusters, right? So workload one should be able to talk to workload two 
And it should do it in a way that's secure, right? And it should do it in a way that where you can control the traffic. And you sh it should do it in a way where workload one doesn't know where workload two is. Like it's, it's the application is, is decoupled from the cluster topology, right? And that should be all controllable at runtime and you should be able to add a new cluster and gradually ease traffic over and, and all that fancy stuff, right? So that's always been the case, since, well, since Linkerd 2.9, that's always been the case. Uh, and we did it by adding this gateway component. So workload one will send traffic through the gateway and then it'll hit workload two. Now in, um, uh-oh, now well, the text updated, but not the, hold on, let's go back here. Okay, there we go. If your underlying network allows pods to route traffic to each other anyways, you know, then we don't really need that gateway component. This is another thing to run, another source of latency. So we added the ability for you to um, just have direct pod-to-pod -pod communication while still preserving all those same properties of, of uh, you know, mutual TLS for security and, and uh, you know, the dynamic request routing that we just talked about. So, and the reason why this came at, you know, kind of in 2.14 is we started seeing a lot more planned use cases for multi-cluster Kubernetes. I think in the early days, the, the majority of the multi-cluster use case that we saw were kind of evolved use cases or, you know, like you started with one cluster and then someone, some other team added another cluster and you're like, oh shit, now I need, oh heck, now I need to, these two things to talk to each other, right? Or you acquired a company and that company had their clusters and, and so you kind of like got into the state where those clusters were kind of naturally running in different uh, in, you know, networking environments or different clouds or whatever. Now, you know, a few years into the, uh, you know, into the present, um, we're seeing a lot more companies that are saying, okay, we're going to, uh, we're going to deploy 70 clusters and we're going to do it on purpose because we want these, you know, we want the, the, the high availability or whatever it is. And in that world, you, you have, you tend to have a lot more planning that goes into underlying networking infrastructure and so you see a lot more of these kind of uh, shared flat networks so this is a nice prop uh, a nice property to have I'm making sense so far okay i talked about gateway api i'm not going to get too much into the into these gory details uh though if you love api conformance and all that stuff uh you know plenty of uh plenty of other people to talk to about <laughs> But like I said, our goal is we, you know, we did achieve performance and uh, sorry, conformance in 2.14. This is kind of a moving target and we're going to keep up with the moving target and move us all towards the glorious YAML based future that I alluded to. All right. And then finally, the most recent release was 2.15, which adds mesh expansion, also known as, well, you know, we put support for VMs, but really it's like support for non Kubernetes workloads. They don't have to be on VMs. They could be on P PMs. Right, that could be on whatever. Um, so mesh expansion is basically the ability to run the Linkerd data plane outside of Kubernetes. The control plane still has to run on Kubernetes. So we're giving you something that's still kind of a Kubernetes centric tool. And the way that you configure Linkerd, you know, I didn't even talk about this at the beginning, but the way that you configure Linkerd or the way that you interact with it as an operator uh, is all through uh, CRDs on the Kubernetes cluster. So you're not like calling some HTTP endpoint and making a, a post or whatever. You know, you're, you're updating custom records uh, or annotations or whatever on the Kubernetes cluster and that's how you configure Linkerd's behavior. And so, you know, in this world, you can now run the proxy outside of Kubernetes, right? You can connect it back to your control plane and you can get the same properties that we've been giving you for pod to pod communication now for uh, pod to uh, external communication and sometimes back to internal as well. Uh, we had to solve a bunch of interesting problems, I think, to do this. The, the, you know, in Kubernetes land, <laughs> Kubernetes provides us a whole lot of stuff that we can use, right? So, for example, it provides us things like service account tokens. We can use that to bootstrap identity. Right. Once you're in VM land, well, you don't have anything. You just have a process running on a, you know, running on a machine. Kubernetes provides us with the ability to, uh, you know, transparently inject the proxy into a pod based on an annotation, because that annotation then triggers a mutating admission webhook controller. Blah blah blah. In VM land, you don't have any of that. You just have a process running on a machine. Right. Kubernetes gives us the ability to, uh, you know, gives us some guarantees around our ability to manipulate L4 
uh, traffic so that we can make sure that all TCP communication gets routed through the proxy in the pod. In VM land, we don't have any of that, right? So there are a bunch of problems we had to solve here. Uh, one interesting aspect is the identity component, especially, uh, is solved for us by another CNCF graduated project called Spiffy. And Spire is like the implementation of, of Spiffy. So we uh, imported Spiffy into the project, or we adopted Spiffy um, for identity for those workloads. There's a lot more interesting things we can do with this in the future, but this is kind of a starting point. Uh, we introduce this new external workload CRD that allows operators, um, uh, allows you to represent you know, the VMs in the mesh. Um, and then you can select VM workloads through label selectors. You can transparently route the traffic. You get a lot of the nice properties that you get from multi-cluster. So that's pretty exciting. The other asterisk, asterisk I'll put on here is this is Linux VMs only. So we don't have Windows support yet. Might be coming. All right, and if you like Spiffy and you like mesh expansion, we've got another great talk tomorrow from Zahari, who's one of our Linkerd maintainers. I'd encourage you to go check that out because this is uh, where you get into some of the, the gory details and the technical trade-offs. I'll leave that up for, for one more second. All right, the other big announcement we made with Linkerd 2.15 is that the project is no longer going to publish stable release artifacts. So for the past eight years, we've been publishing stable release artifacts. We're gonna continue publishing the edge release artifacts, but stables are now going to be left to the vendor community. So the edge release artifacts have all the code in the main repo up to the point where they were cut. That means all the bug fixes, all the security, you know, remediations, all the latest features. We run edge releases ourselves in production. They're great, they work wonderfully, and we would love for you to run these edge releases and have a really, help us get a really fast cycle of reporting bugs, fixing them, and speeding up the pace of project iteration. So primary reason, speaking from the project perspective, primary reason was we want to improve the pace of development in Linkerd. Release engineering is a lot of work. Anyone who's been in that role knows just how difficult it is, especially when you get into the cherry picking and backporting of changes. That work is kind of orthogonal to what we were doing um, you know, in Linkerd to develop features. We need that rapid feedback loop. Um, and ultimately, there's a vendor community around Linkerd that we think can do a better job with stable release artifacts. So that's a change for many of you um, that will require a little bit of thinking through you know, how you want to um, upgrade Linkerd and things in the future. I'm happy to answer questions about that, um, either in person or, you know, in front of the crowd. All right, what's coming next? So, this is my tentative roadmap. And I put tentative on there because we are a pretty nimble project and we can reorder stuff, you know, especially um, when we have really clear, compelling use cases when we have users who are like, this would solve a big problem for us. Those are all ways in which this roadmap has shuffled. One thing that we've gone back and forth on is the prioritization of egress versus ingress. I think where we've landed on that is the very next set of, um, uh, the next major release 2.16 will be focused around egress control. And we're gonna, uh, ingress, which is a much harder problem, we're gonna start some of that design work now but I think we're gonna land that in 2.17. I would expect, I would expect all of these, you know, 2.16 and 2.17 to land this year. So we're not talking 2025, um, but that's kind of the ordering that we have so far. So there's a little bit of cleanup. If you read through my 2.15 um, announcement, we, uh, you know, got some stuff out the door as rapidly as we could, and there's a little cleanup we have to do um, in terms of feature parity. Uh, Gateway API parity, we have these two uh, if anyone's using service profiles, you know, we're kind of in this in-between situation where some features are on service profiles, some are on the gateway API types, and, um, you know, 
you can't really mix them together in certain circumstances, so it's a little ugly, and we'd like to get out of that as soon as possible. We know what the scope of work is to do there, and we're going to do that. Um, mesh expansion for private networks, I, you know, um, I talked about the shared flat network. That's a use case where mesh expansion works today. When you have private networks and there's a gateway component, okay, that's something that we need to add. Again, the work is scoped and we know what we have to do. There's a couple other little cleanup things that'll happen in the, kind of the 215 timeframe. 216, IPv6 support, okay, long, you know, we should have had that a year ago. Um, but if you're watching the GitHub repo, you'll see some of those PRs landing already. So, um, you know, that's, that's in late stages of execution. And then egress is a thing that we're really, um, you know, I think is going to be like the big ticket feature for Linkerd 2.16. So that's, uh, you know, the way it works today is Linkerd will happily route any traffic that you want outside of the, um, outside of the cluster. Um, it doesn't give you great metrics for that traffic for kind of maybe not ideal reasons. Um, and it doesn't really give you great control over that traffic either. So. Both of those things end up being really important, um, you know, especially in security conscious environments. So we're gonna, uh, we're gonna fix that. We're gonna give you, you know, all the metrics and control and, and all that other stuff that you would want, expect from Linkerd, um, you know, for, for traffic leaving the cluster. And then, you know, ingress, hopefully everyone knows what that means, traffic coming into the cluster. Uh, you know, the proxy at this point is capable of handling this in terms of, certainly capable in terms of load, um, you know, and, and, and things like that. But ingress is a pretty large, pretty large feature set. So we have to think through what portion of that we implement first, and what portion comes later, and where are we in the roadmap? For, you know, there's a, a wide spectrum from like I can I can relay a TCP connection to, you know, I can replicate everything that nginx does, right? And like we're going to be somewhere in that, somewhere in that spectrum. But I'm really excited for that because I think there's some really there's some really cool stuff. Once we have 217 in place, then we have a really compelling story for traffic throughout the entire cluster coming in, floating around within the cluster, and then exiting. All right, and that you know that's that's it. This is another slide that's been around since you know 2018. So. Please get involved. This is all, you know, just as true now as it was then. Development is all happening on GitHub. Everything's Apache V2. It's a CNCF graduated project. Like, no, none of that has changed. We've got a community in, in slack.linkerd.io that's, that's helpful. We've got mailing lists. We've got, you know, security audits. So come on in and join us. You know, I'd love to have more folks involved in, uh, in contributing, in testing, and in helping other users. All right, and with that, Let's turn it over to questions. We have eight minutes for questions, and I have five chairs up here. No, no, I'm kidding. There's a, um, it should be a mic on either side of the hallway if anyone wants to come up and, and ask a question. Hello. Hi, William. Um, Hi. So addressing that change in 2.15, if I'm a, putting on your open source hat, if I'm a user, how do, how would I build release artifacts? I'm not asking for the full answer, but how would I go about building release artifacts for 2.15 if, what, how, where is 2.15? Like it's, it's not a tag yet, is it? Yeah, so there's no tag for 2.15. Um, you know, we've considered, there's an edge release that basically is what would be tagged. So we've considered like, well, maybe we just tag that and like, you know, get, get on with it. Um, so, uh, you know, today, if you wanted to have something called 2.15, I would take any, any of the edge releases that is either, you know, from the announcement onward, you can consider that 2.15, uh, you can consume those directly or the entire build process is all open source. So you could also take that build process and funnel into it whatever you know uh, portion of the code you wanted. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. All right. Yes, another question. Um, in our network setup, we are routing traffic between services via a cluster external load balancer. Would mesh extension, extension help us tracking what's going on or are we just doing it wrong? So in your cluster, say that again, 
ex external we have, two, we have two services in our cluster, but they talk to each other via a cluster external HA proxy thing. Yeah. Are we doing it wrong? Or can Mesh Extension help us find out which service is talking to which? This is within the same cluster? No. This is across clusters? Yeah. Okay, but they're both Kubernetes ah, clusters? The services are in the same cluster, but yeah. they talk via yeah. an HA proxy, which is outside of the cluster. Yeah, I, you know, if you can stupid. remove that HA proxy entirely, I don't think you would even need Mesh Expansion. Can they just talk directly to each other, or is there a reason they go through the, uh, that, that HA proxy? That's the question. Yeah. I, so we would need to rework everything. So, I see. Because it's kind of... Old. Yeah, Let's yeah. See. So mesh expansion would not be helpful for that. You oh. know, I think the work there would be since they're in the same cluster already. The same, you know, the work would be to remove okay. that. We're HA, doing it wrong. Okay. Proxy. Yeah. And what mesh what mesh expansion would allow you to do would be to like run a Linkerd proxy in front of that HA proxy. But I don't think that Maybe. solves anything for okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Food for food for thought. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yes, uh, hi. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have one question. Uh, so I see like new features, new developments. Are there going to be support for OpenShift deployments of sidecars in unprivileged mode? You know, OpenShift has opinions about running workloads, and you can't run them with a UID you want. You can't run them privileged by default, and so on. So are there, going to be, are there any plans to support OpenShift? Yeah, so, you know, yes, I would like to support it. I, I think we kind of support it fairly well today, but it seems like we keep finding new issues with open source, uh, sorry, with OpenShift. <laughs> Not with open source, that's fine, with OpenShift. Um, so, yes, I, you know, from my perspective, if we don't support OpenShift, that's probably a bug in Linkerd. So. No, but, but I mean, like, currently, I, I know that uh, you I either need to run the container pod in privileged mode with the USIP tables, because network, uh, I mean, network plugin doesn't work because OpenShift handles it in its own way. And uh, mm -hmm. Linkerd proxy, it also wants to run with some, as far as I remember, specific UID. I, I mean, okay, so, so there is a specific issue today that's preventing it from working on OpenShift. Yes, that's, All right. that's what I'm asking. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come, I would say come, come find me web. and I'll grab an engineer and let's, let's figure it out. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I would, you know, I, 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 Linkerd should have support for OpenShift. From my perspective, we should fix all that stuff and make it work. So thank you. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. All right, we have three more minutes. I think that's time for one more really juicy question. Exciting, compelling. I see someone stepping up to the mic. Hi. Hi. Thank you for. The all right, final question. Make it good. Yeah. Um, I've seen the 1.17 uh, is about the ingress. Uh, do you have some insights uh, about if you're going to use Pingora from uh, Cloudflare? Uh, For ingress, are we going to use what from Cloudflare? Pingora. Um, this is a Rust library that has been released by Cloudflare in the beginning of the year. Oh, okay. And um, they've done a pretty good work with all the library you already use. Um, tower, yeah. uh, hyper, etc. And I was thinking maybe you might add this uh, part in your. In yeah, uh, that's a great question. I have no idea what the answer is, but yes, there is a cool Cloudflare library. It's built on top of Tokyo Tower, uh, Tower H2, all the same stack that we're using already. Can we use it? I don't know, but I know who would know. Okay. So thank you. Yeah, great question. All right, folks, thank you very much. I'll be here for a little bit. I'll be in the Linkerd booth. Really appreciate you coming all the way here. Thank you very much.